So, new Patreon Chris Smith's suggestion was a game called Fahrenheit 3000, which, I'll be honest, sounds like an Andy McNabb novel, but it's not, which is probably a good thing. Regardless, I'd never heard of it before, but Chris was kind enough to offload a big wad of information for me. I won't go into that too much yet, aside from this quote. The game was a bunch of mad ideas thrown together with an equally strange plot attached, because they had to put something in the inlay. So let's have a look at that plot first, shall we? Everyone said that it could never happen. Then came Three Mile Island. They still said it could never happen. Then came Windscale. The Atomic Energy Authority insisted that the chances of a nuclear reactor melting down were a minimum of a million to one against. They might have been, but the odds were not great enough. Passers-by see an unusual amount of steam rising from the cooling towers of the Dragon Reactor. The warm English air has taken a malevolent chill. Within minutes, the whole country has heard the rumour that the dragon is about to melt down. Visions of atomic bombs and mushroom clouds pass through the minds of the fearful local residents. Luckily, the worst that can happen is an enormous radiation leak that could wipe out half of the south coast. Suddenly, what they said could never happen has. Fantasy has become reality. A shrieking siren is heard across the desolation of the Winfrith Heath. The south coast is in panic. The ceramic-coated uranium oxide core has reached Fahrenheit 3000. Meltdown is imminent. There is only one chance. You have to locate and operate all the pressure valves in order to release the excess pressure and flood the core. And, possibly, hopefully, shut down the reactor. But beware, for the radiation count is rising. The valves themselves glow green when there is radiation leakage. The local residents of the reactor have all become contaminated. The radiation count is rising all the time. Shut down the reactor before the reactor shuts you down. So essentially, the game is set inside a nuclear power plant. The instructions seem to be hinting that there is, indeed, an actual dragon involved. And looking at the game's map on World of Spectrum, you'll find that actually, yes, there is a dragon involved. There's a bloody dragon in the power plant. Not that I ever got that far, mind you. Take one look at this game in action, and it's going to be immediately clear where it takes its inspiration from. Everyone's favourite torture device, Jet Set Willy. There are even certain rooms that make light of the fact that this is indeed heavily inspired by Matthew Smith's seminal Spectrum hit. Although, to call it a direct rip-off would be doing it a disservice. We don't say call every first-person shooter a Doom clone, after all. Not now, at least. We certainly did back in the day. And Jet Set Willy Clone was an equally pejorative term back in the 80s. Crash Magazine ended up giving the game 81% overall, but even just a scan of the review will reveal the words Jet Set Willy or JSW multiple times. Fahrenheit 3000 is basically a JSW clone. Although it is a clone, it's still very good and very playable, says one criticism. Game is very good, difficult Jet Set Willy style, says another. If you found JSW too easy, boring or unchallenging, you'll most probably enjoy this one, they continue. This is certainly no weak need JSW copy and it should prove highly popular, they add. It's fair to say that having mentioned Jet Set Willy no less than seven times over the course of six paragraphs, Crash Magazine definitely spotted the similarities between the two games, but overall they understood the differences the two games had, and it was praised. Not so with your Sinclair. Overall, your Sinclair reviews gave the game a three separate scores of 1 out of 5, 1 out of 5, and 2 out of 5. To match this up to Crash in percentage terms, that's a measly 27% score versus Crash's 81% quite the difference. And I guess it goes to show just what fatigue can do for a genre. It happens to the best of them. Gaming has its phases like these. First everyone wants to do platform games, then everyone wants to do one-on-one -on -one fighters, then everyone wants to do first-person shooters, then everyone wants to do massively multiplayer games. There comes a time when the market becomes oversaturated. But is it a reason to hate a game simply because there's many others like it? What's interesting about Jet Set Willy, and indeed Fahrenheit 3000, is that barely anyone can complete it. And when asked, that isn't even the main driver for them to play the game. It's the exploration element. 
Jet Set Willy gives you a fair chunk of lives to do this with, but you can burn through 90% of them in a matter of minutes. Fahrenheit removes lives altogether and instead gives you a time limit. This is brilliant. This is exactly what I would have wanted as a kid. Let me try this screen over and over and over again. Let me practice it. Let me get better at it so that next time I might have a chance of properly doing it. Jet Set Willy would give you a set number of lives to try this before booting you back to the beginning. Fahrenheit 3000 lets you keep on trucking until the timer runs out. This is perfect for what most people would have used the game for, a test of skill in a world that you would set out to explore. It gives you more freedom and less frustration. It doesn't ruin you for a single mistake. There are a couple of other vital differences in tour here. The jumping mechanic of Fahrenheit 3000 is something that's been given a twist. And it's a vital mechanic to the game's platforming, as you'd expect. If Jet Set Willy was all about finding the right place to stand in order to clear a jump, Fahrenheit 3000 manages to multiply the options with wall bouncing. Each time you hit a wall, you'll change direction, whether you like it or not. This makes traversing the terrain difficult, but it also opens up new and curious puzzle elements. Trying to reach certain platforms by jumping and failing miserably soon makes you realise that you have to utilise wall bouncing a lot more than you'd expect. Instead of jumping in one clear direction, you've often got to jump in the opposite direction in order to reach your required destination. That's not to say there aren't plenty of times when jumping forward is vital and you're going to have to be pixel perfect if you want to bridge most of the gaps in this game. It's a harsh mistress the majority of the time and it can fall foul of the most annoying of all jumps the zero pixel gap. I brought this up during the Finders Keepers review, but oh lordy lord do I hate these things. Trying to find the exact spot to jump in order to get your man to land on the ledge is absolute mind poison. You've just got to do it over and over and over and over and over until you finally nail the bloody thing. Thankfully the game usually isn't cruel enough to place an enemy or something in the way at the same time, but still. Give me a chance, all I want to do is get on a bloody platform, you shit. Anyway, it's not all about platforming, as the plot suggests. You need to turn off a load of valves. Now, Chris had provided me with a load of hints, but I wanted to go in blind at first, so this footage that you're watching is me prior to understanding what the hell is going on. You see these things here? Those are valves. You need to collect them. They change colour a lot, I just presumed they were flashing, indicating their treacherous nature, but no, they're flashing very specifically. When I touched one, it was green, and I died immediately, so I avoided them from that point on. When I went back and read Chris's notes again, he explained that you have to touch them when they're red. Yes, red is good in Fahrenheit 3000. It's not the only time it completely confuses you with colour-based shenanigans. There are numerous times throughout the game where you're killed by things you would have no idea were dangerous. Spectrum games of this type would typically make it obvious, but not so in Fahrenheit 3000. It likes to keep you guessing. There's a desert section, for instance, just to clarify, yes, that's a desert inside a power station. You'll keep randomly dying when you're there, and there's no real indication as to why, but basically it's because it's hot. You just have to rush through the area. It's weird, this Fahrenheit 3000. None of it makes an awful lot of conventional sense. The plot doesn't tie up with the levels you're traversing, the colour scheme and mechanics don't align with what you're typically used to. It's not like someone played Jet Set Willy a lot and made a game like it. It's more like someone read a lot of Jet Set Willy reviews and then made a game based on how they felt it would be, using screenshots as a reference. It's odd. Back to those valves though, what a frustration these things are. So they flick between red and green, red being good, green being bad, remember that. You need to collect all the valves in the power plant and, spoiler alert, even with save states up to the eyeballs, I was never going to manage that. But save states I did, and one of the main reasons for that, aside from getting more footage, is because I could not for the life of me work out how to deal with these bloody valves. Their timing was completely random. Sometimes they'd flick really quickly from red to green and back again. Sometimes they'd stay on a particular colour for ages. I had no idea what the hell was going on with them, and it felt needlessly frustrating. And when I finished my final playthrough of Fahrenheit 3000, I went back to Chris's tips again. The valves aren't random, they change colour whenever one of the enemies on screen changes direction. Notch this up as yet another weird feature of this game, and one without any hints whatsoever. The game is weird, man. One of the other things Chris brings up is a particular room called Nelskin Prud. 
He said he'd pondered the meaning of this for the past 30 years and was hoping I'd be able to find the solution of this lifelong conundrum. Well, settle back, because I do believe I've found the answer. Searching online for Nelskin Prud, I was immediately greeted with a Facebook page for Nelskin Care Clinic. Coincidence? I think not. When I looked at the services Nell Skincare provided, I found this obviously cryptic hint just waiting for me at the top of the page, like a lighthouse shining its hot white evidence into my brain. Triad facials. Has anyone even heard of a triad facial before? No. But triad? We all know what triad is, right? Triad National Security LLC brings world-class expertise in... Nuclear operations. Where was Fahrenheit 3000 set? Inside a power station. We were getting closer. There was another piece of the puzzle though. Prud. Nell Skin Care Clinic hadn't used the word Prud, so I did another search for that. I found two hits on Wikipedia. Prud was the name of two villages, but the one in Croatia stood out to me. It was red. Hadn't the game taught us that red was good? Yes, it had. I went to Google Maps and looked for Prud, Croatia. What I saw next almost brought tears to my glands. Where was Prud situated? Near Dragovija. And what does Dragovija sound like? Dragon. Fahrenheit 3000 was trying to tell us from the very start that dragons are real and Triad is covering them up by hiding them in power stations. This was the meaning of Nelskin Prud from the beginning. And, and, your Sinclair was in on the whole thing, which is why they gave the game poor scores. It's a conspiracy, ladies and gentlemen, and Tim Williams, the developer of the game, has never been heard from again. Coincidence? No. Well, maybe. It could also be an anagram, in which case it could mean drunken lisp, nerds link up, sink plunder, drunk spleen, or unsprinkled. It's probably one of them, to be fair. So, Fahrenheit 3000, what to make of it all? I'm going to be honest with you, the game is massively frustrating, but then I also find Manic Miner and Jet Set Willy massively frustrating. They are uncomfortably difficult, to the point where I just want to throw my keyboard out the window and sue for damages. But really, as with Crash and as with your Sinclair, the one to compare it against is going to be Jet Set Willy. It's an almost inevitable comparison. And it's a pretty easy one to recommend because of that. If you like Jet Set Willy, either for its insane difficulty, its platforming, or its exploration elements, then there's plenty to like in Fahrenheit 3000. It doesn't look quite as nice, it doesn't exactly strive to break the mould, but it's got enough differences in its mechanics to allow for a decent companion piece to the Spectrum's token mascot. To be honest, you'll probably already have known if this game was going to be your cup of tea as soon as the first piece of footage was shown. Now... Here's where I normally play the episode out, but this is going to be a bit of an extended one. I haven't mentioned this yet, but let's rewind all the way back to this game's menu screen. When I first booted the game up, I sat and watched the intro tune, as I normally do, and then I started to grin from ear to ear, and then I started laughing as it just went on and on and got more and more manic. And speaking of manic, it's a clear reference to Manic Miner and Jet Set Willy's use of classical music converted to the blippity beeps of the ZX Spectrum. But I will say, if there's one thing Fahrenheit 3000 does better than the two classics, it's got to be this. I'll leave you with it.